Welcome to the Red Chip Poker Podcast, where we share stories and strategies from the game's most fascinating minds. No matter where you are in your poker journey, there's always something new to learn. So let's get right into today's conversation with your host, Robbie Straczynski. Welcome to another episode of the Red Chip Poker Podcast. I'm your host, Robbie Straczynski. And on today's show, we have a special guest who occupies a very unique position in the poker world, Mac Verstandig. Mac is the managing partner of the Verstandig Law Firm, LLC, and focuses his practice on representing poker players, advantage gamblers, and other industry professionals in all manner of legal situations. Mac, welcome to the show. <laughs> Robbie, thanks for having me. It's wonderful to be with you. Good to be speaking with you today. And, and I have to say, before we begin, I must advise you, sir, that anything you say can or will be used against you in the court of poker Twitter. It feels so awkward to have that phrase used against me for once. I'm used to speaking <laughs> out the advice. Good to know you're running the show, no doubt about it. We do our best, Mac. Um, okay, so you have been a lawyer for about a decade now, graduating from the University of Miami School of Law. Did you always want to be a lawyer? I think I wanted to be a lawyer around the time I figured out that my skill set had no other useful applications. I have an honors degree in rhetoric from the University of Wisconsin, and that pretty much qualifies you to either be a political speech writer, to get a PhD and teach rhetoric, to go to law school, or to be the most persuasive panhandler on any given city block. And once I sort of surveilled that field of options, law school quickly became uh, the least awful of the options. Huh. Interesting. Were you like part of debate team or a model UN or something like that? I, I did debate in high school, but I was thrown out my freshman year for being ethnically insensitive. So we, we try not to focus on that too much. Uh, political wow. correctness has come a long way. Sure. Okay. Uh, well, into your proper career, then you opened your own law practice in, in November 2015, and you chose to specialize in the gaming field, uh, counseling poker players, professional gamblers, and uh, this is from your website here, others making a living in or around the gaming industry. Is this a particularly crowded field of law? It is not. I enjoy having something of a monopoly, but it is a lot more fun than the other fields of law. When I started my career, I was at sort of a large white shoe law firm. I was a corporate lawyer doing transactions and high-end corporate litigation. And it was great work. It was certainly challenging work, and I learned a lot doing it. It just wasn't that much fun. Uh, mm -hmm. Gaming law and representing the gaming community is a lot more enjoyable. I find the clients a lot more affable. And it really keeps you on your toes in a way that uh, Fortune 500 companies just simply cannot do. Hmm. Interesting. Is this something that you sort of, when you got your law license, were always saying, okay, one day I'm going to open my practice and do this? Or, you know, slowly but surely, you know, you sort of got tired of, of what you had been doing and, you know, tried to explore something new? I think it was a little of both. I played cards through law school. Since I went to the University of Miami, the seminal hard rock was in the beginning of its heyday when I was in school. And I used to go up there three or four nights a week, and I'd actually bring my textbooks with me. The reason I'm a tight <laughs> poker player is I would fold as many hands as I could so I could keep reading and highlighting. There were some really great poker players in my law school class and the law school class above me. There were five or ten of us who'd go up there habitually. And then when I graduated, I sort of you know, put it in the rearview mirror and thought, like, this was a fun phase of life. I suppose I have to move on from it. Maybe as I move up to Washington, D.C., I can go to Atlantic City on the weekends or something every now and then. Mm -hmm. Once I started working for a big firm, I was surveying the landscape and trying to figure out, you know, what can I do as a young lawyer to make a meaningful impression and to gather some clients who I could actually interact with in a real and genuine fashion? And there's not a lot of big corporations that want to hire, you know, at the time, it's a 27-year-old kid mm -hmm. uh, to handle their legal work. So I started thinking, who has legal problems, some manner of disposable income, and uh, a disregard for age? And I kept thinking back to the poker community. I realized it was not being represented in sort of as clean and upstanding a manner as it could. I mm -hmm. thought I could make a contribution. And then I am the one person in America who got lucky because Black Friday happened. And that meant that a lot of poker players needed a lawyer very quickly. Uh, I got my business card out there, and it's all snowballed since. 
since so Black Friday was a good day for you, you're saying. <laughs> I, I certainly share the poker community's commiseration. I don't mean to <laughs> celebrate that, which has been god awful for so many people. Of course. But yeah, Black Friday was sort of the beginning of my gaming law career. It is funny how just absolute horror for the community writ large uh, turned out to be a good thing for me as a young attorney looking for an angle. Hmm. Interesting. Oh, like you know that you do hear those stories every so often. You know, like when the market crashes, there's always the, the few people who got lucky enough to short at the right time. So there always are some people, I suppose, who benefit. But hey, you know, you 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 made lemonade out of lemons, uh, you know, for yourself and for quite many people who've been served by your legal expertise over the years. You make that sound so much more eloquent and delightful. I sort of enjoy your spin more than mine. Thank you. I'm just reading from the script that you gave me. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, to the uh, outside observer, uh, Las Vegas would seem to make sense as sort of a natural location for a law firm such as yours. And that's where I met you uh, last year at the World Series of Poker. But um, from what I see and all the research I've done online, you're based out of Maryland. Is, is that correct? Yeah, so I, I am a proud son of Maryland. I was raised in Maryland, and while I went away for school, I came back. I clerked for a judge in Maryland. I worked for a large firm in Maryland. And it's certainly been a dilemma for me as the practice has grown, because you're right, Las Vegas is ground zero for the gaming community. But gaming in the United States has proliferated so much in the past 20 years, it's actually viable to be based elsewhere. You know, when I was a kid, if you wanted to gamble legally, which I couldn't do as a kid, but theoretically someone could have done, you had to go to Nevada, you had to go to Atlantic City, or you had to get on a boat and go three miles offshore. Right. By the time I got out of law school, there were casinos in the majority of states around the country. And mm -hmm. that's grown since. Maryland actually has two of the largest poker rooms out there, both of which have significant games. So I spend a lot of time in Nevada. I have a home in Nevada. Um, I share the poker player's dilemma of summering in the Mojave Desert, because who doesn't love the Mojave Desert when it's a crisp 120 degrees outside? <laughs> but I still call Maryland home. I, I am a proud East Coaster, and uh, the folks at Delta Airlines have come to know me perhaps a little too well. You know you're in trouble when they send you a birthday gift, and I uh -huh. got one last year, which means the number of overnights is getting out of control. Oh, boy. Okay. Well, you get that, uh, that lucrative platinum status, right? Exactly. Or gold or whatever it's called. <laughs> so, well, on the on the geography front, here another couple of questions for you. Now, I, you know, beyond having met you and corresponded with you a little bit, I've also followed you for a couple of years on social media, and your feeds indicate that you, you know, as you say, you're constantly on the move, hitting up all sorts of places around the United States, not just Maryland, not just Las Vegas. Is this wanderlust, or do you have uh, numerous clients over the country? You just try to keep us all up off balance by posting sunset pictures from random locations. The fact that you've caught on there to be sunset pictures is the ultimate tell that I'm actually a horrible photographer. So I go for the <laughs> cheapest and easiest angle, which is wait for a pretty sky. Uh -huh. uh, it, it's a combination. I, there's part of me that says, uh, you know, a rolling stone gathers no moss. I like being on the move. And I've enjoyed the opportunity to see, gosh, I've been in all 48 of the lower states in the past three years. Wow. But the other reality is, I enjoy being the preeminent player side gaming lawyer. And that means with the proliferation of gaming, we're just talking about, I've got clients all over the country. If I don't show up and touch them in a meaningful way a couple times a year, I really run the risk of losing my practice over either to someone else or having them go to the main street lawyer in their community. So while I generally fly back and forth uh, three or four times a year, I try to load up the car and do a loop around the country, visit my clients, sit down with them, have lunch, have dinner, make sure they're doing okay personally, make sure their concerns are tended to. And I think that makes it much more personable and relatable when I'm on the phone the rest of the year. And it's been good for me growing my practice. And yeah, it's a good way to see some sites that uh, life may not otherwise take me through. Wow. That's awesome. I, I, obviously, I didn't know what the answer to that question was, but that's just really cool. You know, it's a lot of business lessons that anyone could learn, whatever their, their career is. That's, uh, is that something that, you know, again, had in mind when you said uh, you're going to go ahead and start your own practice or just sort of realized over time that, hey, this, is, you know, makes sense to do? Because I can imagine also you get numerous word of mouth clients that way just with that personal touch. 
Yeah, and thank you. I appreciate that. It's worked very well for me. I, I am, at the end of the day, a markedly introverted guy trying to make it in the legal field where the only thing you have to sell is yourself. You know, lawyers don't make anything tangible. Uh, we are hawking our own services. So I think you're right. It translates well elsewhere. I don't know when I really earnestly developed the theory. I think as I started picking up clients who weren't just in L.A., Las Vegas, Atlantic City, and Maryland, I began to realize that there'd have to be a way to go see them. And then there's sort of the snowball effect, because every time I do go see them and I stop in a local casino and play cards with whoever, I'm fortunate to maybe pick up another client or two. And it's been great for building my practice. And candidly, I like knowing the people I represent. It brings Mm -hmm. me a lot of joy. But Mm -hmm. you're right, it should translate to any number of other practices. As we get sort of more and more of a digitized 21st century world, uh, people need to be cognizant. The human touch is not lost and will never go away. And uh, that is something that uh, still exists in diners, card rooms, and everywhere else around the country where you can sit down and actually meet people and talk to them. Right. Well, that, I mean, poker is a social game. And, you know, obviously the law isn't a, a game by any stretch of the word. But, you know, <laughs> there's definitely a, a lot in common, uh, you know, from anyone who plays live poker and, and what you're saying that you're doing uh, as far as business. Plus, I imagine you have a, a really awesome chip collection if you're visiting so many poker rooms around the States. <laughs> I, I do. I have a spectacular chip collection. I used to have, I think it was 150 different $5 chips from various poker rooms framed on my wall. And I began looking at it and realizing it was actually adding up to significant value. Um, and, and I need to go dig that out of storage somewhere. It's a wonderful thing that I should put up. And I, I do love the differences in poker chips around the country and frankly around the world. All right, nice humble brag with the five dollar chips and the red chip poker five dollar <laughs> chips. Of course, you know I, I'm still stuck on the one dollar level, but I'll, I'll get there. Mike. I'll get there. I, I, um, I have faith in you, Robbie. Call it a hunch. <laughs> well, poker players, of course, you know they, you know, as you said, they live and play all over the United States and and the world. But it's impossible to sort of have licenses to practice in all fifty states or even the lower forty eight. But what do you do when a client comes to you for representation, but uh, you don't you don't have a license to practice in the state that they live? Or I'm not really well versed as far as the law. Like, how does that work as far as licensing? No, so that's an excellent question, and that is definitely one of the larger logistical hurdles that I've gotten good at clearing, but that is sort of omnipresent. I'm only licensed in a handful of states. But over time, I've developed relationships with lawyers in almost every other state with any significant gaming presence. And there is a process where you basically team up with that lawyer on a given case. You do the majority of the work, but they supervise you to make Mm -hmm. sure that you are compliant with the state's sort of idiosyncratic legal quirks. And that's true if you're in court. That's also true on a transactional side. Mm -hmm. And... You know, there are certain states where the lawyers I team up with have become part and parcel of my practice over time because we're just there all the time. And then there are times when I wake up and realize I need to find a lawyer in North Dakota. And mm-hmm. I'm not sure Google has, you know, made it to North Dakota yet. So that takes some <laughs> more research. Well, I, I'm, I'm sure you weren't aware before this, but about 75% of our listeners are from North Dakota, Max. So. And I meant to explain that Google's not yet there because it is such a beautiful state that ought not be invaded by a technological monolith the size of Google. I admire the manner in which they have repulsed the um, driving forces of technology, and I'm glad that your listeners come from that wonderful and gorgeous land. Brilliant. My mother always used to say, love those $5 words. Beautiful. Love, love, <laughs> love that stuff. <laughs> Man, this is fun. I'm enjoying this. Over the like years, Mac. Thank you. Uh, Over the years, uh, I've read a number of your excellent articles on PokerNews.com, and you really do, as you speak as well, you have a flair for writing. I've noticed on your LinkedIn profile that you've also twice had editor-in-chief positions, uh, a year at the Badger Herald, and again with the University of Miami International Comparative Law Review. Uh, What do you enjoy most, as as well as find most challenging about writing? Thank you for the kind words. That's immensely flattering. I love writing because I find it to be an open form of expression where you can take your time, gather your words, and make sure everything is sort of sanded into proper form before it goes out. I loved journalism. If I had my druthers, I would have been a journalist. Sadly, by the time I got to college and looked at the journalistic landscape, 
print media as we knew it was a dying profession Mm -hmm. and digital media had not yet taken hold in any sort of formidable context. Uh, I also have a vocabulary that is perhaps correlative to having spent a little too much time in the library and having never really gotten picked to play on the soccer team at recess. (laughs) And writing is a great medium for me to express that. So Mm -hmm. I enjoy it. I enjoyed my two editor-in-chief stints. One was obviously the college paper. One was my law review. And uh, I I don't know that I would go back to it, but I I harbor those memories with immense fondness. And the poker news columns are great because once a month or so, I could sit down and sort of dust off the old writing skills and have fun with it without the stresses of trying to make a daily deadline. Sure. Well, how did the, your relationship uh, with the site first start? I mean, this is, I think, does it go back even before you started your own practice? It does. So uh, it, it, it's, uh, gosh, it goes back to shortly after uh, Black Friday when mm-hmm. the full tilt controversy started to come into vogue, there was um, clearly some press around it. And I was at a very large law firm and I went to the law firm's marketing director and I said, look, I've read what's been filed in federal court. I understand these issues. I'm trying to get a you know foothold in the gaming community. I've got all these new clients because of Black Friday. See if any media outlets want to talk to me. And the marketing director came back and said, we don't have any really formidable media outlets, but there's some kid named Chad Holloway who's apparently going uh, to interview you. Amazing. And uh, that was the beginning of that. Chad Holloway had the misfortune of speaking to me for entirely too long, and he has suffered the misfortune of being a dear friend of mine ever since. He was my editor for years. And since he went off on his own, uh, you know, it's great to see him in Vegas over the summers, and it's great to call him up from time to time. Sure. And for those who don't know, Chad Holloway is the head of live reporting in the U.S. for Poker News, longtime uh, columnist there, really a great guy as well. Um, very interesting. And, and this, I guess, turned into a monthly column you know, ever since then for you? It has. I think there have been times when it's come on and off, and you can almost see how busy my life is in correlation how often the column runs. Mm. But uh, yeah, it was a monthly column for several years when Chad and Donnie had sort of uh, Donnie Peters, who was the editor of Poker News for a while, had stepped away. I think I quieted it down for a little while, but I just couldn't stay away. Poker News is such a great publication. It has such a broad reach, and they're so easy to work with. Uh, and candidly, I enjoy it. I, I have a mm-hmm. lot of fun sitting down and writing those columns. How do you decide what topics to write about each month or each time that you sit for your column? Generally, I, I sit back and think about what has been hitting my desk of sort of recent note that I haven't spoken about in the past or that I have that needs revisiting and what issues are coming up in the poker community. My cases tend to be cyclical in nature. Uh, You can look at a calendar and with a reasonable degree of certainty, I can tell you the months of April and May are going to be spent dealing with staking agreement and staking issues. The months of June and July are going to be spent dealing with angle shooting issues (laughs) and stuff the like. And then the months of August and September are going to be spent dealing with normally asset forfeiture issues from whatever poor soul gets pulled over coming out of Vegas at the end of the WSOP uh, and tax related issues. But beyond that, there's sort of, you know, more of a finesse. And as I notice a trend or I notice a topic, uh, I'll try to find an interesting angle on it and put it into words. Hmm. Interesting. Well, on, on your own uh, poker playing front, you said you started in college itself or, you know, because I, I saw your Twitter bio, it says old school poker grinder. How old <laughs> school are we talking? So I, I played one game of cards in college. And this is embarrassing because it's actually a cliche joke, but it happened to me. Uh, we were so clueless, we didn't realize we were using a pinochle deck for three hands. <laughs> uh, and then I think quad kings ran into a set of kings and, and we knew there was a problem. <laughs> Uh, poker play started more or less in earnest in law school. I, I've always had sort of a socially awkward side to me. And as a kid, I mean, Miami is a city where even if you're a student, you have to be hip. Miami's full of cool, beautiful people. And I am neither cool nor beautiful. So as I was trying to find something to meet people and to be social, it's like you said, poker is a social game. I noticed people from my law school would go up and play on the weekends, and I thought it was a great opportunity because once you have a seat at the table, discussion is easy. Mm-hmm. So I started playing there. I, I got okay at it. I wouldn't say I got good. Started playing online. 
I have the, um, I, I guess, somewhat infamous distinction of being a fabulous Raz player, which is a truly useless life skill in most regards. So back then during online play, you know, I'd, I'd fire up Full Tilt, I'd fire up Stars. I, I made some good money playing Raz. I made some good money betting horses on the weekends. And then I obviously picked up Hold'em. I don't know that I'm that good at it to this day, but I have a great time playing and I still enjoy the social side of it immensely. What do you enjoy about Raz specifically? The utter simplicity of the game. All you have to do is keep track very simply of what numbers you're holding and what numbers other people could be holding. It is much easier to stalk folded cards because you're only paying attention to half the deck. And it's a game where you have a board lock a disproportionately high amount of the time, which allows you to exploit betting angles in those positions and maximize your upside. I feel like that particular answer is one that I'm going to want to take out and listen to over and over to improve my own Raz <laughs> game. That's a really good one. No, I mean, I have to say Raz, Raz is my least favorite game. So hearing that will certainly boost my confidence. And I imagine our listeners here at Red Chip Poker as well. Um, uh, would you, you have more to say about Raz? No, I, I appreciate that. Thank you. It's very good. It's a, it's a really fun game. And Stud is such a great old school game. And, you know, the few times you do find it dealt, it's a good way to learn about history because you'll be the youngest one at the table by 85 years. <laughs> I would certainly concur. Um, would, would you say that your legal training has made you a better poker player in any way? The cliche is definitely true. Like, there's this whole myth, which I think is derivative of rounders and the old school, old school stories that precede rounders, that a legal acumen and a poker acumen are the same strategic ability to read people, exploit their strengths and exploit their weaknesses to your benefit. And that's true. Uh, you know, my legal training has taught me to be very methodical, to look at things both through conventional and unconventional angles, and to assess all options, which means that in a poker hand, I never feel trapped or cornered. Uh, I never have any shame in letting go of bad hands, and I'm always happy to use sort of less normative mechanisms of trying to induce a raise where I'm ahead or trying to toy with people's reads on me as the hand progresses. And I think that's beneficial. Excellent. Well, I know that uh, if I'm looking for unconventional ways to improve my game, maybe I'll pick up a law book. So <laughs> <There you go. laughs> that's, that's certainly excellent. And, and when we come back, we'll learn a little bit more about Mac's life and career as a poker lawyer. But first, a little strategy break. What's up, folks? Zach Shaw here for Red Chip Poker. And I've got a strategy segment today specifically for those listeners out there whose bulk or maybe entirety of their studying is done with podcasts and YouTube videos and that sort of thing. Basically, the free resources that are out there in the poker world. And let's face it, there are a ton of them, not just from us, although we happen to think that we have some of the most plus EV stuff around. And certainly in our premium memberships, I could totally make the case there, but you've heard me do that time and time again on the podcast. So what I'm going to tell you today is about a page that you might not know about on our site that is going to give you a lot of great resources to get better. But one in particular I wanted to highlight today connected to this idea of going beyond just passively absorbing poker strategy information and being able to study in a way such that you don't have to make expensive mistakes at the table realizing what you haven't actually learned or maybe which concepts you haven't connected together, which you haven't really drilled enough off table so that when you're on the table, that's your drilling of the concepts, which is a dangerous and potentially expensive place to make those mistakes as we both know. So the page I'm talking about is redshippoker.com slash tools. And on this page, you're going to find poker calculators and all sorts of other cool things. But check the upper right hand corner. There's some poker quizzes there. There's one on aggression, one on combos and blockers, frequencies, etc. Now, if you take just one of these quizzes, what you're going to start to discover is what you know. Yes, of course. But what you don't know, what you didn't know, you didn't know. You're going to figure out where you're at in this specific concept so you know what to study next. So yeah, maybe you're just going to another free resource, but at least you know which one of the millions out there to study. 
Now, if you take all these quizzes, now you're starting to map your knowledge across the multiple domains in poker strategy, and you start to get a real picture of how these concepts connect. And again, where to study next, where to spend your precious time on studying, even if it is just passively. But I'm telling you, take a click over at redshippoker.com slash tools or tap on it if you're on mobile or do the voice command. There's a million ways to access it now. I highly recommend that if you've just been soaking up the info, it's time to do a little bit of drilling of the info that you've soaked up to see just how much of it was absorbed and how much more thirst for knowledge you can have as you get better at this game. And it's pretty much infinite because the top players are still learning. So you ought to be still learning too. Learn with us. Redshippoker.com slash tools to take those quizzes. And without further ado, let's get back to the podcast with Robbie Straczynski. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the Red Chip Poker Podcast. Robbie Straczynski here with poker's foremost attorney at law, Mac Verstandig. Uh, Mac, I imagine that you've been involved in all sorts of legal cases over the years. And you did mention that, you know, there's a little bit of a, a cyclical nature to what comes across your desk. Are there any, like, specifically common types of cases that come up? Absolutely. I think the thing we see the most frequently, and sadly, this doesn't come as a surprise, is staking disputes and unpaid debts. For better or worse, the gaming world is still full of people cutting handshake deals to repay this, vouch for that, or whatever it may be. And handshake deals necessarily give rise to legal disputes down the road. Uh, sort of similar to that and a related cousin to that is so many people come to Las Vegas, uh, especially for the summer, but play any number of other tournaments the year over where someone back home will give them a percentage of their buy-in and with a handshake, a hug, or whatever it may be, uh, agree to take an interest in the winnings. And that's all fine and good until someone wins serious money and suddenly gets right. a selective memory. So uh, we oh see a lot of those. Mm -hmm. uh, and fortunately, the you know, contrary side to that is we also get to write a lot of agreements for people in advance and make sure those problems don't exist. Okay. Well, do, do you represent sort of both sides, someone who's making a claim as well as, you know, I guess the defendant in that case? Yeah, I've been on both sides. Obviously, never both sides at the same time, but mm -hmm. I've probably defended as many staking and debt-related claims as I've taken the plaintiff side of. Uh, hmm. It's an insular world, and once you know the idiosyncrasies of it, which are immense, like in the United States, there's a number of states where any gaming-related debt is illegal. So you have wow. to be very careful with those things when you reach an agreement to make sure the agreement's subject to the laws of a state that will actually recognize it. And then if someone's suing on it and they hired someone who's not a gaming lawyer, oftentimes they'll make the cardinal mistake of wandering into a state or a county where it's utterly unenforceable, and it creates an easy victory for us. Hmm. Wow. Well, I guess it sort of anticipates the, the next question I'd had is, you know, for any of our listeners who may be considering entering into staking agreements, you know, I was going to ask for a couple of important tips. So that's obviously a great one of, you know, make sure that it's subject to the laws of, you know, a particular state, which, you know, it, it can work in. Uh, any Anything else that you would recommend? Yeah. The other thing that people always forget, and this doesn't make too much of a difference when it's a big win, but on little scores it does. People always forget to indicate whether or not the buy-in is subject to markup. So you'll have an agreement, and the agreement will stipulate what the markup is, whether it be 1.2, 1.3, 1.5. But people won't specify if first money out goes to the buy-in. And where the problem arises is this. There's a lot of min caches these days that are barely more than the entry fee. So if you've got a 1.5 markup, and the min cash is only 130% of the entry fee, you could have a backer getting back less than what they put up if hmm. you haven't specified whether it's first money out or not. Hmm. And that, definitely not something I've thought of because I've neither charged or have been charged markup, but I can certainly <laughs> see situations where that would be applicable. Are there any types of cases you find particularly enjoyable to work on or or perhaps one that you would love to work on someday but hasn't yet come your way? Yeah, we've been pretty lucky. For all of the quote-unquote regular cases we get, there's always one or two sort of big-picture intellectually fascinating cases that stumble across my desk. 
And I really cherish and relish the opportunity to hold on to those and work them. Uh, a few years ago, and this is all perfectly out there in public knowledge, I share no secrets that I ought not share. Uh, a few years ago, U-Stake was investigated by the United States Securities and Exchange Commission. And the inquiry was basically whether or not poker staking is the regulated sale and acquisition of securities. Hmm. And after defending the investigation for a while, and we realized the investigation wasn't necessarily going anywhere, we actually filed a federal lawsuit against the SEC to seek a declaration that poker staking is outside their jurisdictional purview. Uh, and after we made some progress in the lawsuit, the SEC dropped their investigation. So we rack it up as a win, but awesome. as important as the win was to my client and as great as it was for the industry, I loved the opportunity to play with sort of novel quasi-constitutional, quasi-jurisdictional issues and get out of sort of the day-to-day -day rut of whether Jack owes Jill money or whether Jill is forging documents. Wow, that that's awesome. That really does sound fair. Even for someone who, you know, my wife is a lawyer. I try to stay very far away from law in general, but that is Smart just, man. you know, <laughs> that, that is that is just objectively fascinating. I really like that. And as you said, definitely a, a win for the poker world uh, to have it outside the purview uh, of the SEC. Um, in, in your experience, do most of the cases that you deal with tend to get settled out of court or do the parties involved specifically wish to have their day in court? Yeah, so we probably settle, I would say, north of 90% of cases, which I think is 90. in line. Wow. 90, 90. And I think that's in line with the legal industry norm for litigation. Uh, if every case went to trial, the American judiciary would absolutely crumble under the weight. Mm -hmm. uh, I have learned that the case that you are certain will settle is invariably the one that goes to trial, and the <laughs> one you are certain will go to trial invariably settles that there's sort of a Murphy's Law aspect to it. But yeah, most cases resolve. And I think there's an incentive in the gaming world, perhaps more so than in other contexts, to resolve cases before they even go to court, because there is to some degree a public shaming associated with, especially being called out on a bad debt, uh, being called out as a deadbeat, being called out as an angle shooter or a cheat. So people are often heavily incentivized to make those things go away quietly. And uh, I like to say my firm has as good of a confidentiality clause, I like to think, as anyone out there. And we put it to very good use in a lot of agreements all the time. Sure. And then that actually brings up something I hadn't prepared to ask, but since, since you brought up the idea of this, this public shaming, unfortunately, we do see it happen uh, quite often, uh, for better or for worse. But you know, at least my, I personally have a distaste for public shaming of any sort. But in, in a legal uh, stand, from a legal standpoint, does that, you know, whether it's right or wrong uh, to do so based on any particular agreement, um, the word that pops into my mind, again, not from a legal standpoint, but, for, you know, from the dictionary is the word libel. When someone does any sort of public shaming against someone, is that a problem that people need to be concerned with? And when you do go ahead and do that, are they are they libeling somebody? Uh, potentially, and it's a very real issue. So, uh, libel, slander, and defamation are three intimately related causes of action. Uh, truth is a defense to all of them. So you can say something that is objectively truthful about someone, and you're not going to have too much to worry about. In the United States, we have free speech, so most subjective comments uh, are also protected. There are some exotic exceptions to that, but for the mm -hmm. most part, you can state your opinion uh, and as long as there's no adverse factual inference, you're good. But when people do publicly shame others, they need to be very careful that every sort of factual assertion they're in is accurate, or they do run the risk of getting sued for libel, slander, or defamation. And without using names or identifying details, I will tell you a poker player who was publicly shamed in a somewhat brief, unfortunately fleeting manner uh, is a client of mine, and we are currently pressing a libel, slander, defamation suit because what was said about him is objectively false. Wow. Uh, the allegation was not true. It is provably untrue, and it hurt his reputation. Uh, oh. In the United States, there's a lot of states that say if someone goes after your professional reputation, you don't even need to prove that you've been damaged you're entitled to collect money from them. Now, there are some states that say the cap on the money you can collect is the damages you actually sustained. But poker is a very fluid 
economy reputationally. And I, I don't mean to suggest everything goes back to staking, but this really matters because if someone has been blasted on the forums, it's going to be harder for them to raise staking funds, which in turn hampers their ability to make a living in this industry. So the Absolutely. damage can often be very real. Hmm. Definitely not uh, something you know you want to even semi bluff on. Absolutely uh, fascinating information there, and uh, very. Int- I've never heard anything like that, and you know certainly speaking to the authority on such matters, um, Mac. <laughs> You know, I know this ventures this next question into a bit of, of the territory of taxation, but you did mention that that's sort of uh, a little bit of a of a corollary area that you that you end up dealing with in your practice. Um, there are, of course, different legal statuses tax wise, depending on whether someone is a professional or a recreational poker player. And I know that pros can deduct all sorts of expenses like tournament buy ins, cash game losses, you know, travel tips, meals, you know, massages, you name it. Mm-hmm. My question is, though, is there anything legally deductible if you're just a recreational poker player? And basically, I want to know if I should keep the receipt for the hook that I'm going to buy uh, in the rotunda <laughs> at the WSOK. So as a recreational player, the hoodie's probably not going to do anything other than give you a wonderful piece of clothing, uh, which you can use in all manner of weather, no doubt. Uh, for a recreational player, with a couple of bizarro exceptions, because again, 50 states have 50 sets of laws, uh, you get to deduct your losses from your winnings. Okay. Uh, which is somewhat intuitive because otherwise our tax system would be completely haywire. But it does mean that there's an incentive to really keep track of your losses. I think for people, that can be awkward. Everyone loves going home and writing about a winning session, putting a winning session on social media, telling their friends about a winning session. It's a lot harder once you get felted or once you walk out of a casino with some chips, but far less than what you bought in for, to sort of bite your lip and write down how much of a hit you took. However, that's a necessary offset to your winnings. And if you end up hitting a big score, especially in a tournament structure, later in the year, you're going to be glad to have contemporaneous records of your losses. One of the stories I always tell people is uh, early on in my career, I got a call from someone who thought he might be in criminal trouble because he was selling uh, losing sports betting tickets that he had picked up off a sports book floor on the internet, and the authorities had taken an interest in it. And it took me a couple seconds to figure out what the angle was. But the angle is he was trying to sell losing tickets to big gambling winners so they would have a tax offset. Wow. Huh. Goodness. Yeah. So, so, you, so even a recreational player, though, uh, it, it's very important to, you know, to keep these records just for your own personal, uh, you know, your, per, your personal uh, use, but also for tax purposes, you're saying. It, it, it is. And the line between recreational and professional is also one that can change fairly quickly and that can be quite fluid in nature. You know, many a recreational player come to Las Vegas at the beginning of the summer and mm. courtesy of a little run good and this and that, they're a pro by the middle of July. Mm-hmm. That's a good point. So at what point, you know, is there a particular number or a particular declaration one must make to say, you know, okay, this is what I, this is what I now do for a living? No, uh, fortunately there's not because that would put a lot of lawyers and accountants out of business. Lawyers love things to be subjective so we Uh can mull over it and send people bills. And uh, whether or not you're a professional in any regard is a multi-pronged subjective analysis. And the analysis can actually vary uh, from a tax point of view to other points of view in the legal sphere, you know, there's a lot of states that regard poker as a game of chance. And one of the smart allocate arguments I came up with uh, years ago is if you're in a state where poker is deemed a game of chance and not a game of skill, and you play poker for a living, then if you're ever facing some sort of child support or alimony obligation, the court should assume that you're not going to make any money. <laughs> because if it's a game of chance, why would you have an expected income? Valid uh, point. But <laughs> so, yeah, it, it varies from context to context, but normally there's a lot of subjective things you look at. Uh, earnings are one of them, but they're not the driving force. Sure. And I, again, I imagine that many of our listeners may fall somewhere betwixt and between or, you know, be semi pros or be considering, you know, hey, maybe let, let's give it a shot this summer. And uh, we certainly know who to turn to when we've got that question when it comes tax time. Um, are there any. Are there any uh, particular cases that you found to be incredibly challenging over the years? 
I, I think there's a challenge in most cases. And of course, some of them are more frustrating than others. From me personally, and I won't give anything close to identifying details on this, I know that poker players bluff for a living. And I know that people are often reticent to trust people who seem like authority figures. I don't know how I could ever come across as an authority figure. But a lot of clients, uh, when they first get to know me, perhaps don't open up as much as they should. And the most difficult thing in handling a case is when you learn bad facts from the other side or when bad facts come out in court that you didn't know about. Uh, Years ago, I had a client uh, who I put on the witness stand. I did his direct examination. It went wonderfully. I went back. I sat down at the table. I mean, if I had my druthers, I would have kicked my feet up on the table and read a newspaper. (laughs) I had this case won. And then the uh, opposing lawyers are asking him some questions. And I think three or four questions in, I hear one of his answers begin with, and I'll never forget these words, well, (laughs) I didn't tell my lawyer this, but. Oh, um, ow. (laughs) And if I could have run out of that courtroom, I would have. If I could have found a trap door, I would have ducked through it. So I think that's challenging. And then some of the, you know, a lot of the advantage play stuff is challenging just because you're always trying to stay on top of what the new angle and what the new scheme is. People come to me because I understand what goes on in a casino more so than most lawyers. Mm-hmm. And for the most part, during your consult, I'm not going to ask you the difference between a flush and a straight. But if you do come and sit down with me, the first time someone has to explain edge sorting, I do have to wrap my mind around it. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I had a client once who used to shove light wands into slot machines. And it took me a day of trying to figure out mechanical engineering to understand how that would break a slot machine to pay out. Wow. Very interesting. Well, I know as poker players, we're always trying to learn not just from our experiences, but also from missteps that we've made. Is is there anything, you know, I, I guess that, that unfortunate experience is one, but is there any particular uh, mistake that you have made in the past that you feel you've learned from and become a, a better lawyer because of it? That's a humbling question, if ever there was one. I am confident that I handle every case better than the last. I think that early in my career, when I was at a big firm with lawyers who handled all manner of law, it was easy because I would bring in a case, I would handle it, but I could always call up someone who specialized in this area or that area. Mm -hmm. When I went out on my own, one of the better things I did was I very quietly got a group of friends who practice in some very different legal arenas and cut agreements with them to consult with me on the side. So the first time I had a poker player on my own with a trademark dispute, I did the whole case, but I would very sheepishly and quietly call a friend once a week or so and make sure that I was doing everything right, have him look over things from the perspective of a trademark lawyer. I've never failed to do that, but I have nightmares all the time about what would happen if I did fail to do that. And I think constantly remembering that I don't know everything out there and the you know quantity of knowledge that I'm yet to come across far exceeds anything I've sort of tactfully assembled in my short time on this earth is hmm. important to be aware of. That's a, a very humble answer. And I think something that resonates with anyone who plays at the felt as well, whether you're <laughs> a recreational or even one of the high roller poker players. On the flip side of it, Mac, then, are there any particular career achievements uh, that you're very proud of that you could look back on and say, hmm, that's awesome? I'm proud of a lot of cases here and there. You know, I remember winning my first jury trial. I remember winning my first bench trial. I remember the first time I argued in front of a federal appellate court, stuff like that. Uh, I'm not one who tends to be into the somewhat superficial world of lawyer awards. Lawyers tend to have remarkable ego issues, so they are constantly giving each other awards to try to put something on their wall and in their waiting room. And I remember when I was 29 years old, I I was given the moniker of being an AV-rated attorney by Martin Del Hubble. And I don't think I really understood what that meant. It was apparently like quite an achievement, and I had done it before I turned 30, which was even more of an achievement. And I think I paid a hundred and some odd dollars to get a plaque to put on my wall. And to this day, it's never been on my wall. It just gathers dust in a closet somewhere because I can't imagine having someone over to my office or my home and having to explain to them why it is that I have some sort of self-congratulatory thing on the wall. It just doesn't much interest me. Hmm. But um, 
you know, some of the cases we've won are achievements of which I'm proud. And uh, the fact that there are no losses that I look back on with huge regrets about strategy, I think is probably my greatest achievement. So I, I'm happy there. The last question we've got for you, and it's, uh, you know, it's something that I've sort of gathered from you know this entire conversation that we've had. You know, you've enjoyed your time at the felt as well as a career in poker off the felt. You seem to have struck a, a pretty darn good work-life balance that combines your passions. You've been able to do some traveling as well, see the world. Do you envision anything changing for you career-wise in, in the years and decades up to head, or this is the golden path and, and you're good? I love what I do. I love every moment of every day. I am 30, gosh, six years old and uh, single and I like to think that at some point in time, perhaps I will turn down the travel a bit and spend some of my recreational time, not necessarily in poker rooms, but in other social settings. I have parents who would love for me to find grandkids for them one day, and that's something I need to turn my eyes to. But there's always tomorrow, and uh, for now, I'm focused on today. Sounds good. Well, both in preparing for the interview and, and throughout the conversation, uh, I've said it before and, and it bears repeating. I couldn't help but admire the eloquence and the refinement uh, with which you speak, Mac. It's It's been a pleasure having you on the show. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to share with our listeners before we call the next witness? Uh, Robbie, <laughs> okay. Love the law <laughs> puns. Thank you for having me. This has been an absolute blast. And you know, if there's anyone out there who ever needs our legal guidance, I enjoy meeting with people. I enjoy trying to help people through their situations. And I'm sure I'd be delighted to help you out, whoever you may be. Uh, our website is mbvesq.com, which does not translate particularly well to audio. But if you Google me, you'll find me. And uh, you know, if you ever see me around the hill, come up and say hello. My business card's a poker chip, and you can add one to your collection. Excellent. And uh, from personal experience, it is fun to play with Mac at the Felt, not just to speak with him here on the podcast. I just want to thank you again, Mac, very much. We've been chatting with Mac Verstandig. This is Robbie Straczynski, and you've all been listening to the Red Chip Poker Podcast. Thanks for tuning in to this week's episode. But don't stop learning now. Head over to redchippoker.com. You'll find everything you need to get better today. Join our free, friendly strategy group and start talking poker with our coaches and community. And listen, if you're ready to take poker more seriously, sign up for Core, our $5 a week complete training platform built for players who have limited time to study. Core is packed with over 100 bite-sized lessons from the fundamentals to advanced strategies, quizzes, achievements, discussion threads, and more. And for the bravest of heart, we invite you to check out our pro membership, which includes 24-7 24-7 access to hundreds of videos, all of our playlists, all of our crash courses, and more. If you want to see what the top 1% of players are studying to keep their edges razor sharp, visit redchippoker.com slash ruby. That's R-U-B-Y. And get a special deal on your first three weeks. Until next time, run good, play better, and get there. <laughs>